Welcome again to the policy track. Um, and welcome again to uh, B Science Atlanta, sponsored by Kennesaw State Information Systems, NSA, Coal Fire, and Coldesky Security. Um, our next speaker is Mr. Ryan Wilson. I'm sorry. <laughs> and uh, he has the floor. Now, hi. I'm uh, thank you. I'm Ryan Wilson. Um, I uh, come from over from Augusta. Uh, so instead of wearing any kind of corporate attire, I try to support the symbol of Augusta here, the master of the Augusta National. Um, the, uh, I, uh, I work part time for Spotlight Cybersecurity. My full time gig is uh, somewhere else, but I've, in doing this work, uh, I've come across uh, I've been trying to implement uh, you know, a bunch of different security things for a couple of clients that we service. Really, I really just do a couple of uh, uh, local contacts. Uh, but I enjoy sharing about what I learned, so I wanted to share this with uh, with you to see what you uh, see, see to sort of share the ideas and kind of get some feedback about it. So I'd love to kind of continue the discussion with you after the, the talk is done. Um, you're welcome to ask me questions along the way, but since I have only have half hour and I wanted to convey a lot, I might just kind of cut questions short. And if you don't mind, so we can talk. About, I'd love to chat during lunch a little bit more about this uh, subject along the way. But I, I frequently find myself in working on this in uh, wanting to deliver this sort of enterprise experience to my customers. Um, uh, the, uh, like give them like all the crazy features and give them this fantastic time, um, but I only have this kind of beer budget. Like I said, this is a sort of part-time gig for a small company and we're trying to figure out how do we do that. So I've always been looking for ways to use open source products to try to help us out and to use sort of free things or to just do cheap things that are easy to integrate all together. And so I kind of came, wanted to share with you sort of the concept I have for how to do that. Like I'll tell you what we've been doing, what I'm going to try to do still and uh, how to do it. But I want to just kind of caveat my whole uh, talk here in that typically when you're trying to save money, the trade-off is time. You know, not always. As you'll see, there's a few cases where it's an example. But if you look for some of the more free options, like the trade-off is that, you know, you're the integration point. Like you're going to end up spending some of your time along the way. Now, I frequently find myself at the point where I have more time than I have like disposable money to spend on cool technology stuff. So this works out all right for me. But but just be aware that like you know if you if you do this, if you grab some open source products and try to put them together, like you're the one integrating it. You're not paying somebody else to. And if it breaks, like you have to figure out how to fix it. You don't have somebody else to go to. So just keep that caveat in mind. Like I said, it's not does it just it applies generally, not to every little specific part. But I wanted to kind of show that. So, so why have I been doing this? Why was I interested in continuously monitoring? Well, I have a couple of clients that are telling me like they're, they, they, they have trouble sleeping at night. You know, like they're worried that somebody's going to be in their network. Um, but primarily deal with some healthcare providers, uh, so they have to worry about like HIPAA compliance. And as I used to tell my students when I would teach at Augusta University, you know, the odds are against you as a defender. You know, the, the, as a good the defender, you have to plug every single hole. The bad guy only needs one to get in. Um, and it's a matter, you know, when they're going to get in. Like, you just have to sort of operate under that assumption. But the, interestingly, the odds flip once they get in. Now, we'd like to keep them out, but if they get in, the odds flip. Like, they have to cover every single one of their pieces of trail. You only have to find one to kind of be able to pull the thread on that. So can we be looking for that? So that was sort of like where my interest was in this. And I also, just as an aside, I've more, uh, been kind of liking the sort of new buzzword. I've seen continuous assurance instead of saying continuous monitoring. Because I, as the provider, I'm doing continuous monitoring for them. But what they're getting is continuous assurance. Like, that's what they care about. They want to feel good all the time that their business operations are going well. And so I kind of like that buzzword. I'll use continuous monitoring to talk, but I just wanted to kind of could apply it. Words matter, and the continuous assurance helps me think about it from my client's perspective as to what they want to get out of it. They want to just feel confident that business operations are going and that their data is safe along the way. So, so where do you start? If you are new in this field or your student want to get started, as a couple of you had sort of said uh, to me while I was asking questions out here in the lobby, um, there's a bunch of places to, that can help you out. Unfortunately, some of them are funded by your taxpayer dollars, so they're free downloads on the internet. Um, there's a couple of good frameworks that I've liked. The NIST cybersecurity framework uh, was at version 1.1 last I checked. And the CIS uh, top 20 security controls was at version 7.1, the last one I grabbed, which I think was last week. So the, uh, these are really good places to kind of start when just sort of thinking about like what should I be watching on my home network or a small business network or any kind of network. Um, and I really liked, um, haven't read through the entire release since it was pretty new and it's a long document, the CIS controls. I like the way they 
redid it lately to say, hey, if you're a small provider, worry about these sets of things. And as you get to be a bigger company, like they have these implementation groups now to kind of help you think about where should you uh, start. But um, it, it's not enough to just grab some framework, though, and do it. Like, you know, you can't just grab somebody else's stuff and make this work. Like, you've got to figure out what's important for you to protect. So step, step number one, really, in any of these things is, like, figure out, what do I care about? Like, you, you know, CIS controls is a quote from the paper. They said, you see, it's still important for you to understand what's critical to your business or home, what data you care about, what systems, what network. You've got to consider kind of thread. Uh, but they give you the questions to ask yourself. So they're a good place to start along the way. Um, also, uh, if you're working in a business situation, look to the regulations that apply to you. Like, I'm dealing with some healthcare providers, so I, they care about HIPAA, and almost everybody takes a credit card now, so there's usually some form of like PCI compliance that you're concerning yourself with. And while I haven't seen it affect technical rule, a couple of my clients uh, have to deal with OSHA type stuff. And that's like you can look to those to kind of help you out. Um, and if you're at home, like just worrying about your home network, you know these guys will give you, like I said, some of the questions to kind of get started with. Um, particularly, like I said, I'm going to reference the NIST cybersecurity framework. So it's just to kind of give you a little context. They break it up into these sort of five functions, um, and then a bunch of different categories. And so these give you questions to sort of ask yourself and kind of walk through about what should I be answering for my network based on kind of best practices. Um, the other great thing about the NIST cybersecurity framework and the CIS controls is they're already threat um, informed. You know, the people who generated them were looking at a lot of threat intelligence and said, hey, these are the things that will matter most for your network. So in thinking about this, I came up with sort of there's six things that are essential for you to have for a continuous monitoring system. Um, number one is you need documentation. You gotta write down like, what are we protecting and how should it work? So for my clients that I deal with, like, they need to tell me, what should the system look like? How should it be working? How should it be behaving? Like, they got to communicate that to me. I can't answer it for them. I'm not the expert in their business domain. They've got to answer some of that, and we've got to kind of capture that, because that, that helps me know, like, what should we be watching on the network? So step number one. Step number two, you know, you gotta have some, you got to collect some data. You know, you'll see in other talks here, generally data falls into two categories. You've got the endpoint stuff, which is like where you've got like a software agent, you know, maybe like a McAfee or OS query running on a box, giving you some data about that system. But then you'll usually typically have some network agents, like a hardware sensor or a network tap that's going to gather network stuff, like Dave Shackelford was talking this, this morning about, like, you know, you got that, each of you're pulling that off a span port or something. Uh, the, uh, you need a place to store that data uh, safely once you've pulled it off of those t sensors. You need a way to transport that data, get it from the client systems back to yours. You need a server where you can run analysis on, and it's recommended that you do that out of band. Like, don't do it on the network you're protecting. Pull it off and run it someplace else. And then you need some analytics, like, what on earth am I looking for? You know, you got to know what, what, what should I be looking for watching in the network. And all those are kind of informed by what you document. Now, what I've seen in practice, though, when I've worked with both my clients and just watched others do this, is that these bottom five here, these are the fun technical stuff. You know, this is why we come to B-Sides, is to hear about, like, all the cool technical stuff. And that top one, the documentation, it's the boring part. You know, <laughs> we don't want to write it down. And if, you, if we do write it down, um, almost always do, do we never go back and update it. And it ends up falling woefully out of date with what is actually happening on the network. Uh, and along the way, and it's but it's sort of ironic because like every framework, every sort of cybersecurity best practices thing that I've ever read, uh, like the CIS controls, the NIST cybersecurity framework, and NSA's manageable network plan, like all of them say the first thing you should do is write stuff down. You know, so they all say you should write documentation, and yet we tend not to do it. Um, you know, just a couple of things here, like all of these parts of the NIST cybersecurity framework talk about documenting stuff. You know, I just pulled one part out of the CIS controls, talks about make sure you document the security configuration standards. So they're saying this is really important, and yet we don't do it. Um, and so, you know, I, one of the things that in, informed my idea was like, how could I make keeping the documentation more fun? You know, so that we actually would do it while accomplishing all these other things along the way. So from this point on is the work in progress. So this is sort of the current state of what I'm working on, um, and I'll kind of give you some pointers to where I'm trying to go with it. But I, like I said, I really would value your feedback from this. So like I say, if you'd like to continue the conversation, I'm here for lunch, and I got my, uh, you know, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter or email. I'd love to chat with you some more about this and kind of continue the discussion so we can move this along a little bit.
So my goals uh, in the short term were my clients were telling me they wanted regulatory compliance. They were really concerned about HIPAA. Um, and interestingly, what the Health and Human Services puts out on their website says that they, it seems to suggest that they care more about that you document that you're not doing something than do it and not have documentation. It's sort of funny, you know, but like I so said, they really want it to be written down. And what I found was that two of my clients, they had bought stuff from lawyers to cut documentation to cover the privacy rule. Like when you go to the doctor and they give you that thing to sign, they had bought a package for that, but they hadn't done anything for the technical rule, like how their systems were operating. Um, and I had another client that was telling me, like, you know, I know HIPAA says we need to do all this stuff, but like I personally just really care about Windows updates and making sure my antivirus is working. And I was like, well, it's a place to start. We'll start there. Um, I really wanted to come in and at least start going through the CIS controls with them, you know, because these are prioritized. Like, so let's start by inventorying what you've got, both hardware and like what's running on your systems, and then let's make sure that your like your systems are keeping the patch levels up to date. Let's just watch those things at a minimum and make sure. And because I'm also providing a little bit of IT service to these guys, uh, I also just wanted sort of what you know a managed service provider does, like a remote management and mo or a remote monitoring and management system. I just want to make sure, like, hey, are the systems up? Are they running? So these are sort of the questions I was starting out to ask. And I want to show you how I'm doing it today. So the architecture that I've, I'm working with here is I've got my office here, and I have just just showing just two like two two sort of exam, uh, examples of clients that I work with where they've got some systems on a network, and I drop a router at their location. And in one client, like I am the router for them, so I can control everything going in and out of their network. The other client, they already had a sort of fancy firewall in place that they didn't want to replace, and so I dropped my router and made it just act like a host next to it. And I'll tell you why I did that in a minute. But essentially each of these, my devices, has a little VPN, open VPN client on it, and it calls home to an open VPN server, which my you know, office calls into too. And I just run the open VPN server out on Google Cloud. I'll give you some more details about that in a minute. Um, but these routers uh, are a real powerful tool for helping me get insight. So I started with the documentation. And this is a setup. I've been working on this tool that I call Shirty, uh, where I wanted to make it easy for me to code it. So I actually write the code, the documentation in Markdown. And this is a screenshot from Visual Studio Code. I've been a dar diehard uh, Vim uh, editor person for years. Visual Studio Code is almost making me want to maybe give up some of that because it's just so handy now. I'm, I'm getting bought into it. I was surprised the Microsoft product would do that to me, but I really like it. But it, and when you're coding in Markdown, you know, the same stuff that you're using when you go to like Wikipedia, like it will render it for you right away so you can kind of see what it looks like. Then I run it through the tool and it'll pop out a nice pretty web page that I can give to my client that I can host and so I can see like, you know, here's some details about the system, here's what the system looks like, and then we've got some, you know, details that the client gave me about the system. And I'll kind of show you why this was helpful uh, in, a, in a little in a later example here. So we started with the documentation. Then I started looking, okay, well, where am I going to get the data from? Well, I wanted to use uh, these, these OpenWRT routers. Now, I'm not going to have time to kind of get into all the cool stuff that you can do with these. I spoke at B-Sides Augusta back in the fall about these. So I got 30 minutes if you want to learn more. There's the QR code to the YouTube video of the talk. The, uh, but essentially, these, a lot of these sort of Soho routers that you can pick up on Amazon, they are uh, really full-fledged Linux systems under the hood. And they have all this functionality and the stock firmware you get, like this is a Cisco Linksys device. The stock Linksys firmware, for example, will water it down and just give you, the user, a few options to choose from. But you can replace the firmware on these things with OpenWRT. Um, I've been using OpenWRT for over a decade now. I've been, it just gives you such flexibility. So you can like, you get the full IP tables firewall, this is Linux. So you can control like every little thing. Then you get the firewall logs from it because it's capturing them the same way any Linux system would. Um, they, uh, there's a bunch of other neat things you can do with it. Like the, not everyone supports the same features, but for example, like if it has like a, a certain wireless chipsets, you can actually do what, put them in monitor mode. So I can configure these things remotely to start watching what's all happening in the Wi-Fi space at my clients, capture that data, and bring it back for analysis uh, and doing it all remotely. Um, most of them allow doing OpenVPN, which is one of the reasons I used it, to kind of have, have ac access to my clients' networks in a secure way. Um, so all this great functionality uh, that you can tap into by just replacing the firmware on there. 
Um, I, lately, I said that when I gave my link talk back in besides Augusta, I was liking that uh, particular Linksys model I showed. Uh, lately, I've been really liking this one from GL uh, iNet. The, uh, this one's uh, awesome because it's like well, it's only forty-five dollars on Amazon, and when I checked earlier this week, Amazon was offering me a coupon on it. Uh, but this company actually builds this for OpenWRT. Like it comes with OpenWRT already on it. So you don't have to mess with any of the firmware flashing, so it's a lot safer. Um, and you can see it's really small. It was designed to be a travel router, but it actually works really great for a lot of different situations. Um, so I said full like you know, Linux uh, operating stack, and I'll just tell you a few things that I collect off of this. So remember how this sort of fits into the picture. Like this guy's sitting here, so you can see all the traffic. Now this guy's not, all the traffic's not flowing through it, but because of where it sits on the host, it still sees most of what's happening on the network, so I can get good insight into what's going on. So on this device, at my clients, I have them configured to capture sort of NetFlow data using the SoftFlow D package. You know, it just captures, uh, it's continually capturing uh, the, like, what flows are happening. So it's just, this is like the, the TCP IP tuple, you know, a source destination IP address protocol, and then if it's TCP or UDP source and destination port, how much traffic was exchanged back and forth and so on. Uh, and uh, I also, you know, on where I am the router for one of my clients, I'm able to, uh, there's a DNS resolver on it. Uh, so I'm able to capture all the DNS queries going on the network. I sort of force them to come through my device so that I can see, like, okay, what hosts are we hitting on the network? Capture those logs. Um, you can capture full PCAP using these things. I am not doing that right now because of space concerns. It fills up the hard drive really fast. The, uh, but you can do it. I've tested it. Uh, there's a great package that comes built into OpenWRT called Daemon Logger, which makes this really easy to do. The, uh, you also get everything, you know, everything that we captured in sort of syslog and the system logs. And so in the, in the client where I am, the router, it's great because I get DHCP logs right coming off of this device. And I also get uh, wireless logs, like when a, when a client's, you know, laptop comes in the office and associates with the access point, that shows up in the logs. And so I can get logs of like exactly like what's happening on the network that I can capture. I also typically will peer at, do a cron job, I'll show you in a second, that grabs the ARP table, which just allows me to match IP addresses and Macs real easily. Um, even on that client where I don't have, where I'm not the router, where I'm just hanging off of it, like there's so much ARP traffic broadcasting, it helps me to be able to see well, what, that gets this how I find out the inventory of what's on his network. You know, I can see all that traffic going back and forth. I mentioned before, I've not actually done this with the client yet, but I've sort of tested it at home, but I can activate the monitor mode on these things remotely and be able to just do a survey so I can do rogue AP detection. You know, I can see, hey, did somebody turn on a wireless device and here that wasn't before, or more practical one that happens is like, hey, my wireless is running slow. I can look and see like, oh, it's because your office neighbor turned on their access point on the same channel, and it looks like you're having some errors happen. Let's just change the channel. But so this is some stuff that I can all do remotely now because this device is so capable. And if you, if you didn't catch the arrow here, I highlight there's a USB stick sticking in here. Um, this thing has some, some has a small bit of flash on it where I can store data. But I usually supplement that by adding some store USB storage so that I can save this data off locally while it's waiting to get pulled back for my analysis, which I'll show you how I do in a minute. Um, this device in particular is really nice because it's not only got the USB port, but it's actually got a micro SD slot on it, you can actually easily add, uh, extend the storage on it so that you can store a lot of stuff locally on the device itself. So I just have a couple of simple scripts that run on the devices. You know, basically this runs in a cron job like every five to 10 minutes, you know, just grabs the contents of the, what's in the ARP table, outputs it to a temporary directory, just tag it with the current date and time stamp, and then I move it from the temp directory into the pickup directory. Uh, I do that in two steps because while it's writing the file to disk, if my pickup software comes in and tries to grab it, it would get a partial file. So, it, so the move operation is atomic. Like it'll move the file all in one step, as long as it's the same file system. Um, the, but essentially that's why we do it in two steps. And I grab like DHCP leases as well. And this is just a simple way I can get some easy data off of the device periodically that I can pull back. So, um, I mentioned, how am I going to get the data back? We've got to have a way to transport it. Well, I told you I had this VPN server I run out on Google Cloud. Um, I host it in Google's Compute Engine. Um, it's just an easy way to have a place where my, like, I know all the systems can connect to. Uh, I run it. It's a, a Docker container um, for OpenVPN. Uh, it's hosted in Docker Hub. You can link to it off of our website. It's spotlightcybersecurity.com. Uh, the way I run it on the Google Cloud platform is I use Google's container-optimized OS. Like, that's the image. 
It's a, it, like Dave was mentioning about the move towards immutable infrastructure. This is a, a sort of semi-immutable Linux image. You can't really change it. Like you can't add software to it. It's got everything it needs already built in to run Docker. And so I get load the image, and then I just run my uh, open VPN uh, container on it, and it spins up the VPN server for me to be able to work. Um, I thought I would take just a moment to sort of, for those, like he, he, Dave kind of covered a lot of this already in his talk, but for those of you who haven't uh, done much with the Google Cloud platform or either like AWS or Azure, you know, the whole idea here is just to rent storage and computer and pay for what you use. So the real savings are is if you don't need it running 24-7, like if you could just spin up you know, a compute engine, do the analysis and shut it down. Like that's where you could maybe save some. For me, it was a little bit more about the time. I found when I kept trying to save money by just grabbing an old computer out of the office and using it, like I was spending so much time dealing with hardware anomalies, getting the image installed, uh, my whole hard drives would maybe go dead periodically, and I was constantly having to deal with hardware stuff. Like the nice thing about having Google or AWS do this for you is essentially you you're outsourcing all the hardware maintenance. Um, now, you, you don't have to worry about like, the hard, tracking the hard drive performance. They took care of that too. Now, they, uh, well, depending on which option you go with, is they might do some of the software maintenance, like the serverless stuff he was talking about there. Now, both AWS and Azure, they offer you free trials. You get about 12 months, and if you give them a credit card, you have to give a credit card, uh, even though it's free for the time period. Um, they give you about $300 to get started and just pay attention to your usage along the way. But they have a few always free services. So for example, Google Compute Engine, they give you one micro VM with 30 gigabyte hard drive for free every month. And so my VPN server, it doesn't need much memory or CPU, I run it in that and it's essentially free for me to have a VPN server running 24-7 that helps this uh, network work out like this. Uh, also, the documentation I mentioned, you know, get, Google gives you free private Git repos. So there's a bunch of sources that do that, but like if you want to use Google Cloud Source, like you know, as long as you're less than five users and less than 50 gigabytes, you can host your sort of source there for free, and that way it's not just sitting on like my laptop or home office system. So how do I get the data back? Well, I'm using Apache NiFi right now. Um, this is a, a, a just show of hands. Who's heard of Apache NiFi? It, this is a really cool uh, data flow manager. Um, I run it um, on a server just using, uh, using it in a Docker container, the officially provided one. Um, and what's really neat about it is that you basically sort of drag and drop your data flow. You, know, you, you, you say, hey, I want to set up this processor, and then like, you literally just like, drag the processors together to say, hey, run that data from there over here. And then you can see it all in a nice picture. So you can see like this one just processed you know, four, you know, 400 files in the last five minutes and sent it through. And if you ever to get a backup, like some kind of hang up in the data flow, you'll see these queue numbers start to go up. So you can kind of see, hey, where's my data stuck as well along the way. Um, now what you can't see at the top here is where, the, where I reach out via secure shell. There's a processor that says do a secure copy. It logs into the router at the client, pulls the data off of it, and then you'll see a little funnel point at the top, and then it funnels down. Like this one says, hey, is that PCAP data? Okay, come over here because i got to change the file name on it before I go on. And then, hey, pull out the data, and then, then this saves it on the local hard drive in a special directory layout. So this is a, a NiFi is a free open source tool that helps sort of do enterprise data flow management. It was really designed for getting data set up to go into the cloud, but it's a really handy thing that you can use even for sort of smaller setups like what I've been doing. Now I'd like to try to use my uh, custom tool here in a minute to do some of this work, but right now NiFi is an easy way to get started in doing this. All right, so I've talked to you about everything about like getting the data, like some of the data I want to grab, about bringing it back and storing it locally. What do we do with it? Um, well, I, this is the custom tool I've been trying to build. It's called Shirty. So this is a screenshot of something called Jupyter Notebook. Um, and I was using Jupyter Notebook for something else, and I was really inspired by it. And I said, hey, you know, what if I could do that concept for my security analytics? You know, Jupyter Notebook was really designed for data scientists and do data exploration. And it's all about like where you keep sort of like the documentation and the code in the same document together. Um, data scientists use this to say like, hey, we're going to go explore this thing. They write about like how they did it, and then they put the code, the Python code, to do it right in the page itself. And I thought that's a really cool concept. Now. Jupyter was really designed for you to do it live. Like you, you basically run it one time 
um, and or you keep fixing it up as you're working on it. Um, I wanted something that would help me with my continuous monitoring, and so I took this concept and have been putting it into that surety tool that I mentioned. So I wrote this mark down here. You can see I've got like a little excerpt of Python code here for doing the CIS control number one. Like I want to be able to reach out to the customer's system, to like in this case one of my routers at a customer network, um, I, and I want to pull back like what does the ARP table look like so I can see well what's running on the network right now. You know, what systems do I see on it? And so you can kind of see I have this collect step and all it really does is run SSH to go out to the router and pull back the ARP table. And then a parse step here where I parse out what the router told me and then I test it to see, hey, do we see, is it working? Is it, is it coming through? You know, um, uh, VS Code uh, rendered it for me here, but the idea here is then that it outputs a really nice little uh, HTML page. So I'm going to switch over and try to show it live um, here. So I've got, this is the documentation I have. I have a network map that I made up for the customer from my, everything that we went and laid eyes on on our network. This is just done using draw.io, so sorry, it's not real fancy looking. Um, but, but in order to make sure it stays up to date, like I have a little test here that actually looks at the map file and says, hey, do you see all the right nodes in it? And if not, tell me. So apparently there's a phone that's supposed to be on the network that we didn't document right. Now down here I have um, that visible systems one. I said it reaches out and does that ARP, and then you can see the results that came back from it here. Like I said, here's from running the SSH command, here's the raw output that came right off the router, and then that's used in this test here to say, hey, are, are these all systems we know about? And it told me, like, hey, there's three systems on the network that we don't know what they are. You know, well, maybe you should go check that out. And then this little bit of this little piece of Python code here, just you know, about 18 lines of code, is what generates this output along the way. Um, and lets me know, like, hey, something's, something's you know, you, you want to go investigate these three systems. So I got to go call my client up and say, hey, check this out. Now, if you'll notice I've sanitized a little bit of the stuff here. This is actually real data from one of my clients, but I tried to uh, obscure a little bit of the information from what they had there. Um, and then I do all this and I include some tags to say, why are we doing this? You see there's a little hashtag here. This goes back to the NIST cybersecurity framework. So I can see, you know, that, like, I, ID.am-1 said, said we should be inventorying all the devices on our network. Well, here's the test that says if we've got an inventory. So now if an auditor shows up at one of my client's networks and says, hey, show me that you've got your network protected, we can give them this page and say, here, we went through each of these steps. And you can see we haven't done all, nearly all of them. We've done a few to get started here, but we've got a lot that we still got to walk through together to help make him feel like there's complete. I picked the NIST cybersecurity framework because there's a mapping to HIPAA for this particular client I was dealing with, but it's, uh, it was an easy, uh, it's, but it's, it's not designed to be healthcare specific, it works in just any case. And you can document it here and say, hey, we're not going to do this one for these reasons, but at least then it could be written down. And then up here I can know, like say, I can keep track of like, hey, did we, uh, you know, is, is something off, you know, let's say it turned red when it was wrong. Um, I wanted to show a couple other quick analytics that I'm doing with this data. Um, one was to, to, for CIS control number two, keeping an inventory of software. Uh, I mentioned like we use PowerShell to kind of pull Windows data. So we've got like this short little PowerShell script here that just runs a couple of commands to just look very, very simply for what software was officially installed on the system. Um, and then we, put, we run that out on the client and pull that back. And I have a, in the Python here, I have a list of the authorized software, what like I, in conversations with the client said, hey, this is the software that should be on our system so far. And then it renders that nicely here. So for one of, the, one of his servers here, you can see all the software that was installed was saying, hey, this is all authorized. But we had this uh, other server here that was used for some development has got a whole bunch of extra things that were installed in it that we need to go through and figure out, hey, is this allowed or should we chip mount monitor or something else. So like I said, this was one of the allowed software, but all this other stuff that he had installed for doing some uh, uh, company work, um, some from advertising actually, you know, was, uh, was not one of the things that we talked about being allowed on his network. And then we link that also back to the cyber, to the cyber, this cybersecurity framework. And then the last one was 
the uh, Windows updates. You know, we've got, uh, let me go down to it right here. I said I've got my, you know, short little PowerShell script here that basically says, hey, do you have any updates that are waiting to be installed? You know, so I ask Microsoft, the, the individual desktops about it, um, and then we look through that list, and basically we're looking for, hey, is there a critical or security update that's pending on the system that we should alert about? And then, for example, we have here, we have like this system, like it's got a security update that hasn't been installed yet, and so it gives me a, a quick little red thing saying, hey, I need to go call him and say, hey, something, you need to make sure you go manually hit the go button. They're supposed to install automatically, but it's been experienced that sometimes they don't. They require a little manual intervention. This lets us feel confident, like I said, that continuous assurance that, hey, the updates are installed. Everything is working all right on the system. So the, uh, my half hour is up. Um, I, uh, I want to just kind of walk you through the, like I said, some of the analytics I was running and how to do that. Um, I hope to kind of turn this into a little, uh, make this an online web app. Right now it just it renders the HTML files for me offline. Um, instead of me reaching out to the client and running this, the Python, the PowerShell scripts and stuff like that, I'd actually like to just put a little small Python agent on the box to pull the results. And I'm also not storing the history right now. Um, the, uh, I, right now, I, I, when I pull new data, I'm overwriting it in that tool, but I'd like to keep it. Um, I'd ultimately like to kind of move away from the NiFi case, but NiFi is just so nice to have that picture um, for looking at. I found that really handy. So before I kind of do my quick summary, though, I'd just like to take any questions. And if, uh, anything I've talked about so far, please feel free. So what made you choose, I guess, um, Jupyter Notebook over something maybe that require a lot less like customization like Elk or something? Yeah, so with Elk, like you still got to create the analytics. Um, and I may, I, what I'd actually like to do is use Elk in the background because it's really cool for processing a lot of data real fast. But it's the documentation part, the, like, like what, what should we look for in Elk? Like that's what I wanted to capture in my Shirty Jupyter Notebook-like tool, like is to write down like why are we looking at this thing. Like with Elk you can set up the dashboards but you need to know what you're looking for. I wanted to have a place where I could write down like the playbook, like he was like Shackelford was able to mention this morning. Like, what's the what's the playbook that we should be going through to look for when we want to know are are the systems up to date? And that's why I was looking at the, these tools. What I kind of like to do is like if there's a if there's something that's going to need a lot more data, is how like for example looking through NetFlow stuff or all the DNS queries, like have it spin up a cloud server. Uh, have uh, run the processing, which might mean spinning up Elk, loading the data into it, doing the processing, and then just throwing the whole thing away when I'm done with it. Because Elk, at least when I've tried to run it at home, is a beast to maintain. Um, and so I just wanted to throw it, stand it up real quick, put the data in it, do the answer I want, and then toss the whole thing away and move on. Um, that's what I'm going to try to do next. But like I said, the real reason I was looking for it was to try to get um, answers around the, or to document like why I did stuff and have it captured in a place that would just run it continually. Yeah? Uh, for your uh, Windows collection, are you just doing a PS session off the, uh, the on-prem device? Or? Yeah, it essentially, I, I, it's essentially what's happening. It's using um, the Python library WinRM, um, which is what you, what Ansible uses. So it's, it's the same underlying infrastructure that Ansible uses to reach out. And so I'd like to kind of use the Python endpoint rather than have to enable WinRM on the client network, um, just because that introduces some potential, like I said, increases your risk, sort of risk area. But um, WinRM was pretty easily supported, and it was already, like I said, the one customer I had, he had it in his group policy. It was just a switch he had to click to make it, make it so I could see all of his devices. Right. But that's how I get the PowerShell to the system remotely right now. All right, well, just kind of closing, I said I walked you through the sort of six things I thought were necessary. You have documentation, you know, write down what we're doing. We need to collect the data. We've got to have a place to store it. We've got to be able to pull it back. We've got to have a place to analyze it. And we need to have, like, what do we look for? Um, and I kind of showed you how we're doing it. If you thought any of this was interesting or would like to share in uh, helping me build or release any of this stuff, I'd really love to chat with you after we're done here. So thank you for your time. Thank you.